My name is John Stewart, and I'm the Associate Dean for Cultural and Community Engagement in FIU's College of Communication, Architecture, and the Arts. And I'm the Executive Director of the Miami Beach Urban Studios. And tonight, I am delighted that we have another Associate Dean, although this time a Senior Associate Dean, in the School of Environment, Arts, and Society. It's Heather Russell, and she's joining us as part of our, our series, Zen and the Art of Writing in America. Um, and so I'm going to pass this on to uh, my partner in this, Deborah Briggs. And Deborah and I have been doing this since the end of March and uh, hosting weekly gatherings, exploring our mindfulness and our centering our, during these tumultuous times. And uh, Deborah's with the Betsy Hotel, a sister institution in the real world, just a couple blocks from where we are at Embus, and uh, with very similar kind of uh, core values around experience, arts, culture. And uh, Deborah, it's always a pleasure to see you on Monday night at seven o'clock. And um, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I wanted to take a moment and give special thanks to our community partners before I introduce our special guest. Always the generous, kind, and talented John Stewart, Associate Dean at FIU. He's also Executive Director of Miami Beach Urban Studios and his team, in particular Colette, who's just been so amazing in this process. We also have a captioning professional, um, Kim Falgiani and her team. And John will tell you more about how to get some close captioning for this event so we make sure you catch everything that is said. I also wanted to mention the City of Miami Beach, the wonderful team of the Department of Cultural Affairs. MBUS, Miami Beach Urban Studios, is a pillar institution in Miami Beach. And there's a team there that supports what we're doing. And then finally, the Arts and Business Council of Miami is always amazing because they've helped us to build this audience. We've had about a thousand households join us in the past 10 weeks, which has been amazing. Um, my Betsy family, that includes the Betsy Community Fund and the PG Family Foundation, and most of all, the artists and scholars that have shared their time with us and their talents over these past couple months to let us in on the secrets of how they're finding Zen in these challenging times. So now let me share a little bit about Dr. Heather Russell. She's our special guest this evening. Dr. Heather Russell is Professor of Literature and Senior Associate Dean, as John said, at FIU. And she's taught at FIU since 2003. Um, she is the co-editor of uh, a second book. Her first book is Legba's Crossing, a Narratology in the African Atlantic. And it is a, a part of the general scholarship on black modernity. And as I began to say, she's the co-editor of a second book, collection of essays on Barbadian singer Rihanna, and is published in numerous journals on a wide array of subjects associated with African-American and Afro-Caribbean scholarly concerns. Um, for the past 12 years, she's worked, and this is very exciting, with uh, state-based affiliates of the National Endowment for the Humanities, uh, training teachers um, to teach about the great American, Nora, Zora Neale Hurston. She's twice been named one of South Florida's top black educational leaders by Legacy Magazine. And I wanted to share a quote by Heather. Of course, she's gonna be talking to us herself but, you know, this is a quote that resonates so much now as we're all struggling with the things that are going on in our world. And she says, whether engaging with students, teacher training, or community outreach, my goal is always toward the unfinished project of the realization of the unfettered ability of peoples of African descent to live lives of decency, dignity, and humanity. It's a pleasure to introduce Heather Russell this evening. But Heather, before you begin to speak, John's going to tell everyone how to uh, release the captions right. uh, so that your words can be read and heard. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Enjoy the evening. Thank you, Deborah. And I was just going to say one other thing um, <coughs> before I get to the captions, that tonight was uh, planned to be a conversation between Pablo Cartaya, who was our, our stunning star uh, of last Monday night, and who will be the host of the, of the future uh, events in this series. Uh, tonight, he's had a, a, a family emergency and isn't able to join us, but we're, we're confident and hopeful that he'll be able to join us next Monday. So the, tonight is, um, is going to be a conversation between uh, two associate teens. You can imagine how exciting that could potentially be, um, well, for us at least, but uh, it's really a conversation um, 
with Heather about her work and her feelings around these times and what she's thinking about. And if you want to have, um, you should put your, um, I recommend that you put your screen into speaker view so you see Heather when she speaks. And at the bottom of your screen, you'll see closed, the little CC closed caption. If you go to the up arrow right next to the CC, you can click on, um, you can click on the closed captioning and uh, see the uh, see the words, and then you can get a transcript in the of the closed captioning at any time, and and read it or go backwards in the in the transcript as you need to. So, with that bit of housekeeping uh, taken care of, um, Heather, it's great to see you tonight. Um, and uh, I know when we were talking earlier in the day about this, we kind of spoke about um, kind of your impression and your you know your incredible incredibly astute uh, astute student and scholar of our current condition looking at how we express who we are and how we how we talk about ourselves and i was wondering if um you might kind of talk about where you feel we are today and kind of help position us and center us Thanks so much, John. Um, thanks so much, Deborah, the rest of the team. I am extremely uh, thrilled to have been asked to um, speak tonight, share a few of my thoughts with you. Um, I have very, very fond feelings towards the Betsy and the work that is done at the Betsy. I'm truly a unique institution uh, in our community. And uh, I'm just very happy to be a part of the conversation. Um, when we were first conceptualizing, when I was first invited to, um, to participate in this series, um, we were, of course, in the, in the midst of the current pandemic um, in terms of COVID-19. Um, we, as many have argued, and, and I would agree, have been in the pandemic of uh, institutionalized and structural racism for hundreds of years. Um, however, uh, it has been thrown sort of into sharp relief, certainly in the last couple of weeks um, with the uh, with the, the murder of, of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor um, and really sort of bringing to the fore um, for many Americans who, you know, um, might have read some headlines and other kinds of things from time to time or remember, as I do when I was in, in, uh, at university, the uh, responses to the acquittal of the uh, police officers um, in the in the Rodney King um, trial, um, and more recently um, the acquittal of George Zimmerman uh, in in the Trayvon Martin trial. Um, so you know the 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 moment I think um, is a is an extremely powerful moment, and it is one that um, is probably for many of us you know depending on our positionality filled with a range of emotions and it invokes um, a range of, of, of feelings from um, for some confusion and, and, and misunderstanding, for others uh, fear, um, for others uh, pain and trauma. Um, and, you know, I think that if there is um, anything that's, that's truly, truly uh, hopeful and optimistic about this moment, is that I think I can safely say that in my lifetime, I have never seen um, this number of um, and range of outpouring from young people demanding uh, that we, uh, not just young people, people across the board um, demanding that once and for all, we finally look squarely at and tackle um, institutionalized racism and in particular, uh, the ways in which um, you know, police brutality and, and violence against black men and women has become in many ways normalized. Um, so so uh, it, is a, it, is an, it, is, it is a daunting moment. It is also, I think, an extremely exciting and promising moment. Um, and, you know, it's one of uncertainty for sure, particularly as we have these sort of two um, events that are happening um, Coterminously, um, and you know, I think there is much for us to to learn and and to um, 
to be part of the conversation, but also to, to really listen um, and hear from those that, that we, we might, who, who, we, who might not have otherwise been granted um, space to speak. Ken, uh, you're obviously a, a, a very accomplished scholar and, um, and theorist and writing about this. Have you, can you point to ways in which your writing has helped prepare you for this moment? Um, and I, it, it, it probably comes about in ways you do, don't even expect, but I'm wondering if you can reflect on that. Yeah, so, you know, I, there, there are two things I'll, I'll share um, that, I, that I think you would find um, interesting, I hope. So the first is that um, the book from which this uh, lecture series finds its title, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, was actually a book that I read as a sophomore in, in uh, college and university. Um, I went to Rutgers University in New Jersey, which was a um, private, I'm uh, sorry, it was a public institution, a large public institution, um, urban serving institution, and um, demographically in some ways similar um, to FIU, to Florida International. And I was at that time, I think two years um, having lived in the United States, I migrated from, from Jamaica um, where I grew up and uh, had many of my formative years and then um, began university. And so, you know, sort of navigating the, um, the racial terrain was very interesting because it was a time when we were very actively involved in the um, anti-apartheid movement. And at that time, Rutgers was, uh, as, many, um, as, as many academic institutions and corporations, so they were still doing business with corporations who were doing business in South Africa. And um, we thought that as students, as activists, it was important for us to, to insist that our university, our public university, divest. Um, and so um, we were very active with the diversity share movement. And I would say in some ways, this moment feels akin to that. Mm -hmm. um, however, there was a way in which, because that was happening in this place called South Africa in the continent, and was not happening here, it was, um, you know, there were people who were, were willing to engage and critique the structural and institutionalized racism in another place, but not so comfortable and willing to really look honestly um, as, as we are, are sort of now doing um, at our, our own um, inadequacies uh, in this country. So anyhow, um, so in as that, so reading Zen and the Art of my Motorcycle Maintenance, um, you know, it was a part of a um, honors program that I that I was in, and one of, or probably, three or four of us who were black students in that, and it was the first time that I was really sort of introduced to to mindfulness and philosophy, and we, it wasn't called that then, of course. Um, and looking back, that text, um, if for those of you that that haven't read it, it's a texts where, you know, the, um, the protagonist, if you will, uh, he and his son, um, it's quasi-autobiographical, um, take this motorcycle uh, journey. And it's, it's really sort of meant to be a, 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 um, a journey into sort of thinking about how we live in the world and how we, how we center ourselves in the world. Um, but of course, you know, it, it is a journey that's very much in keeping with a sort of traditional American, particularly masculine American narrative, right? Of sort of, you know, it's Huck Finn going out, you know, into right. the territory and, and, um, and, and he's able to be mobile, right? They're able to move across borders and boundaries very seamlessly, right? Because there are certain privileges accorded them. Um, and so, you know, it's interesting looking back at that text and how, how um, seminal it was, if you will, um, but looking at it now through these fresh eyes and thinking about these questions of um, embodiment, these questions of borders and boundaries, you know, who gets to, who gets to move and in what spaces and how our bodies, um, you know, which bodies are, 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 are contained um, and which bodies are, are granted tenure. You know to move freely um, 
And of course, this gets into for us in Miami, certainly in South Florida, it gets into all kinds of questions of immigration and, and, and other kinds of things. But anyway, so I was thinking about today and uh, I found a quote from, from, uh, from Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance that I thought I, I, I might share because I do think it sheds some uh, interesting light on, on the moment that we're in now. So um, in it, uh, the narrator says, on a cycle, the frame is gone. You're completely in contact with it all. You're in the scene, not just watching it anymore. And the sense of presence is overwhelming. And if we think about the ways in which I think we, um, we have um, traditionally, conventionally sort of viewed um, you know, the, the history of uh, Black people in this country and um, peoples of African descent globally um, through, through this sort of, um, you know, through this, if, if you think about sort of the metaphor of like being in the car, right, and the window sort of frames it, right, there's so many framings of what that narrative is and that framing might be, um, you know, through the lens of the distorted sort of misrepresentations of, of, of Black subjectivity, um, the frame is always, um, you know, returning us to its original um, moment of framing, which has to do with this notion and idea of, um, you know, uh, innate black inferiority on the one hand and intrinsic innate white superiority on the other, which becomes really critical and important in order to make the, um, you know, make, make slavery, the enslavement of black people okay, right? So, so there's a long sort of historical framing um, and trajectory, and we can move that forward, you know, all the way through sort of the language that gets um, used to describe a young black man, you know, the, 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 the language of the thug, um, and so on, right? These are all frames, and so part of, if we think about what happens when we remove the frame, right, and when he says, you're completely in contact with it all, right? You're not watching it anymore. There's a sense of presence. I mean, I think in many ways it's where we are right now and part of what we're grappling with, right? Because the frame, you know, is now sort of, um, is, is, it has now been lifted and we're having to really confront and face and talk about and think about um, what are, are really sort of longstanding uh, complexities around race and identity and humanity citizenship and uh, mm -hmm. equality and access and all of these things um, that, that I think are um, long overdue. Right. No, I, I totally agree. I think it's a, you know, f fabulous way of kind of thinking about it and placing the argument. And I was wondering whether, you know, uh, George Floyd's body and the, the video of him personalizes this in a way that we didn't quite feel during the days of anti-apartheid where it was more kind of corporate body that was being, but this personalized body um, that's male in this case, that's kind of initiating this. I was wondering if you, if you could reflect maybe on how um, the male body that has kind of ignited this, um, this dispersal of the frame, as you've talked about it, this kind of exposing of what's behind the frame, in your own work, you tend to deal with female bodies. Have you, um, or, or I, from what I know of your work, it, it, no, it's not always true, but I'm just thinking in terms of Zora Neale Hurston or Rihanna, your more kind of larger public works have been about women. Is there some way in which gender, do you think, a gender kind of plays a role in, um, in what we're talking about now or, it, or in how you've established your research trajectory? So, um, so I would say that, that I, I have, I have um, definitely, uh, in terms of research, focused on intersectionality, not just in terms of sort of men, um, not just in terms of uh, Black women um, and, and the relationship also to sort of class position and sexuality and all of that stuff, which is very important. Um, but actually, uh, a couple of the, the authors that I very much focus on are, are male authors. Um, in particular, um, Earl Loveless, who is a Trinidadian author, um, who has a wonderful book that I, that I uh, think um, 
again, you know, talking about sort of finding Zen moments, it, you know, in, in the wake um, of the current moment of, of sort of where we are currently, you know, literature, of course, I think has always been, been that, that refuge, at least for me. Um, and, a, and a way to sort of work through and try to, to figure stuff out, right? Um, and so uh, in Earl Lovelace's Thought, um, it's the name of his novel, it was published in, uh, I want to say 1991 or so, um, but it's a wonderfully uh, rich book that frames many of these issues around historical legacies of, of, um, of slavery, but also the struggle for uh, independ independence in the, in the Caribbean. Um, those are very masculinist struggles. They're very much framed in terms of black masculinity um, and have historically had at the forefront of them, um, you know, a, a sort of narrative of the, the, the nation and nationhood as framed within notions of black masculinity, even as the nation itself is kind of viewed as female, which is this word kind of dichotomy. But anyway. Um, so, uh, so in Salt, um, Lovelace brings together sort of the emancipation moment, the independence moment, the post-independence moment, and the challenges, right, for um, in this country where you have this ethnic clash um, between Indo-Trinidadians who have this history of indenture and Afro-Trinidadians who have this um, history of enslavement, and then Anglo-Trinidadians who sort of descend from the plantocracy. And how do you make a nation out of all of that, right? How do you, how do you figure out who we are as a nation um, when we have these intersecting, um, complicated uh, relationships um, and histories and differing kinds of um, access and, um, and different you know, traumas? And how, how do you work that through? And I think, um, though it is set in Trinidad, I think it is very germane to the moment that, that we are in now. Um, and so in the beginning of the, of the, of the narrative, there's a, a wonderful, um, wonderful sort of setup for the, for the story that's gonna unfold, uh, where he talks about sort of the, the landscape um, of Trinidad and the ways in which um, it sort of sets the stage for for the moment that, that they are in. So in Salt, he writes, watch the landscape of this island. And you know that they could have never hold people here surrender to unfreedom. The sky, the sea, every green leaf and tangle of vines sing freedom. There was no natural subservience here. The plantation people couldn't handle them. They beat them. They hold them down and turn them over and do whatever wickedness they could manage, but they couldn't break them. And then it dawned on them that you can't defeat people. 400 years it take them to find out that you can't hold people in captivity. 400 years and it didn't happen just so. People had to revolt. People had to poison people. Port of Spain had to burn down. Haiti had to defeat Napoleon, people had to run away up the mountains, people had to fight, and then they agree, yes, we can hold people in captivity here. But now they had another problem. It was not how to keep people in captivity, it was how to set them at liberty. And so this, right, this moment is very much a moment in which we are trying to figure out what does liberty look like? What is this experiment in democracy? Um, you know, what could it be, right? Um, if we were truly to hope to, to um, if we were to hold true to the, to the ideals and the vision. Um, and, but it's difficult because we all come to this space from, um, you know, with very uh, different histories and, and, and different relationships to, um, to this nation, right? To, to citizenship, right? So that that when you when you when you think about or you you talk about the sort of denial of personhood that we see in that moment when um, you know George Floyd is dying in front of our eyes, being killed in front of our eyes, 
um, it is it is it is a denial of humanity much as it is a, it is a denial of belonging and, and citizenship and it's that paradox I think right that that really becomes sort of the struggle um, that 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 many of us have to work through you know so I was you know I had a um, an interesting uh, my sister is amazing. She's sort of the person that keeps the, all of the generations together. And I also post on Facebook. I'm like a Facebook voyeur. Right? I don't, but, so I read it. <laughs> it's not a, you know, I just, I, I don't know. I don't have that gene. But she's the one who really sort of pulls us all together. And so she set up a meeting of, um, of the generations um, on Zoom on Sunday. And um, my my parents were there. I'm very blessed. My parents are um, 91 years young and um, have been married for 61 years now, 62 this year. Um, God bless them. Yeah. And, um, and, and got married as an interracial couple. Um, my mother's British, my father's Jamaican um, in, in England in the 50s. And so we're having this conversation right, with, you know, mom and dad, with their respective history, with my god, um, my, my grandnephew, who is six, who is weeping and telling us that he's scared, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. And we're, and, and then my, my nephew, who, um, who is himself, uh, in now an, um, an interracial relationship with, with a woman who is white and has been having these very difficult conversations with her parents about, you know, what's, how to sort of manage and interpret the moment. And it was very powerful and important because it, it, it sort of, um, it was a reminder that even sort of within the family, right, we all come to this place with a diff different different sort of visceral um, senses of where we are and, and um, having to really sort of navigate and talk about and talk to each other. And the generational divide was very interesting. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, my, one of my nieces said, look, I know who my white allies are. And for the people that are acquaintances, like they got to do the work. I'm not going to do the work for them. <laughs> right. I will send them the link, you know, to sort of, figure out what resources they need to read and to get up to speed, but I'm tired. I'm not doing that work. And her mother, and her, another aunt, got into this dialogue about, you know, sort of, well, you know, but people don't know, and what is your responsibility? And so there's these very fascinating in, in, intergenerational conversations that are happening within families all over um, that, I suspect um, are probably long overdue and are probably happening in ways that, that have not happened uh, heretofore. So. Yeah, and those, those complexities are so, um, they're so embedded within one another because people are you know, obviously products of where they grew up and their family, but they're also their own personality. Some people are exhausted by this moment and some people are maybe not exhilarated by it, but at least energized and motivated by it. And, and it's almost like there's a, a, a component of DNA in here that you're, that layers into the generations that layers it. So I think any, it's almost like you can't, if you're, if you're thinking about painting and thinking about making something with a single material, there is no, there is no pure material out there. We're all so such complex um, kind of uh products of our of our personalities our positionality our kind of uh the structure of our lives and, I, and so i i'm you know and I'm, I'm wondering because we're really talking about literature and american uh, writing in america and i'm wondering if you um would ever write about what you just described in terms of that family dynamic um, whether it's ever, whether that kind of thing would occur to you. You're such a scholar, but you may also find a scholarly moment in these very personal moments. Yeah. So I'm very daunted by creative writing and creative writers, <laughs> even though it's not too creative nonfiction. I leave that to my colleagues, you know, 
in creative writing. I get it. I get it. Um, yeah. But, you know, I, I, I don't know. I'm not sure. I think right now my energies are, um, so I, you know, we, we have been um, crafting um, documents that are meant to sort of help to speak to the moment at, at the college level. Um, I'm also, you know, someone who I think, I think it's, it's really important. And, and John, you know, this just from um, now our roles as, as um, you know, at the, at the Dean level, um, there are things that we can do. And writing is a, is a critical piece of that. Um, but having a seat at the table and being able to sort of um, empower folk who, who might not otherwise have a chance. Um, I think is also uh, is also equally important, but um, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. I, I I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, <laughs> and I just wanted to jump in here that uh, I'm not usually the one asking all the questions, <laughs> although I'm happy to. But if you have any questions, please direct them to me, and I'll try to uh, I'll try to um, feed them on to Heather and uh, for her for her take on things. But. I was just going to go back a little bit to your yeah. research on um, on Zora Neale Hurston in particular, and wondering whether and how anything that you studied in um, in Hurston and her work and her yeah. incredible kind of connection between place and 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 uh, identity, um, whether any of that resonates for you uh, here and now. Well, I mean, so I am, I am what uh, those of us that are um, real sort of Zora aficionados call a Zora head. So like we're, we, you know, it's, yeah. So Zora is always relevant. <laughs> for some concern, of course. <laughs> no matter what's going on. Um, because she, you know, she was, she was truly genius. And, um, you know, there's a, 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 what her, if you have, for the audience, if you have not seen her documentary, uh, the documentary that was done of her on PBS called Jump at the Sun, I strongly recommend it. Um, it, is a, it is a really, really rich sort of insight into, um, you know, this just uh, brilliant, audacious, um, you know, black woman writer, um, anthropologist, folklorist, uh, scholar, um, who was genuinely a trailblazer. So, um, so I, I have been privileged to, to work with the Florida Humanities Council, as, as um, Deborah mentioned, um, in leading a teacher workshop um, on Zora Neale Hurston for several years, many years, um, and have worked with now hundreds of teachers all over the country, um, helping to sort of frame her and put her in context. So she's most known, of course, for um, her novel, Their Eyes Were Watching God. And that novel was um, written while, while she was in, in Haiti. It was written in seven weeks. Now that's brilliant writing. Um, and, you know, has, has become in many ways a staple um, in, in classrooms really all over the globe. So the couple of things that are really, I think, significant about, um, about Zorro and which speak to the particular moment one has to do with her um, recognition early on that the distorted representations of Black culture, especially Black speech, um, Black rituals, um, that, that these were, were incredibly uh, damaging, right? So if you sort of think about what were the predominant images of um, African Americans, um, at the turn of the 20th century. They were very much sort of archetypal, um, presented to support the idea that even though slavery had been abolished, that um, full inclusion, full citizenship um, was probably not a good idea because black people just weren't ready for that. When they just, you know, were not prepared for that. And so you have these various archetypes that emerge. Um, like the mammy figure, um, like the the um, this the sort of coon figure, um, who become classic, really American archetypes. Um, while this is taking place in popular culture, 
Zora is studying um, black life. She is she is an eth ethnographer. She's a um, she's also writing about it um, in in terms of collecting folklore and writing. Um, she writes for um, a collection called the Florida Negro. Um, she works with some of the the sort of major um, major, major ethnographers um, during the uh, WPA period in the forties. And so, you know, she is not just collecting and preserving, but then she turns around and theorizes what's happening within Black expressive culture. So when we think about the ways in which um, things like, um, you know, certain kinds of um, Black speech, Black patterns, but how they get framed, right, um, as justifications for, or, or ways of being as justifications for um, institutionalized racism um, and systemic racism, she's engaging in a sort of um, counter narrative that is meant to really give the lie to all of that. And so, um, so, she, so she's radically important at that moment. She uses her research then to inform her novels. And so she was um, actually uh, grew up in the first black town to be incorporated uh, in the United States, which was, as many of you would know, in Florida, called Eatonville. Um, if you haven't had a chance to visit it, it is wonderful. Um, and it is about uh, 10 minutes north of Orlando. And um, it's, it is now on the historic registry. So there's an interesting story about how it comes to be on the historic registry that I think is emblematic again of the kinds of the kinds of issues that um, that 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 uh, you know folk who are now sort of shedding a light on and as I said throwing into sort of sharp relief what's been happening um, to Black communities are, are doing so. So uh, Zora, so most of her novels are actually set in Eatonville or their Eatonville scenes. And um, though at the turn of the 20th century, there were, there were many sort of small black enclaves, black towns, um, Eatonville was the first to be incorporated. So 1887, you have this moment of incorporation. Fast forward, it's the mid eighties. And Eatonville sits right beside a neighboring town, Maitland, which is predominantly white, more um, sort of affluent, but they, they, you know, there's a very cordial relationship between the two towns and the councils and so on. So we know in the 80s, when we look at what happened in, in Miami with the building, you know, of, um, of uh, the 95 to cut, you know, sort of over, um, over town and, and the challenges in terms of Liberty City and so on. Um, same thing happens in New Orleans with the building of the I-4, right, which, which radically, um, you know, sort of transforms the, um, the, 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 uh, the, um, the ninth, uh, what's now the ninth court um, in New Orleans because of, for similar kinds of reasons. But all of these things are being done in the name of progress, right, in the name of modernity, right? We need these highways. But they're very specific decisions about where these highways get placed and whose communities get to be run through or run over by the highways. Same thing happens in the Bronx with the Cross Bronx Expressway, which, you know, Afro-musicologists would argue really leads to the birth of, um, of hip hop. So, so this convergence. So in Eatonville, Orange County decides that they are going to five lane the road that runs through Eatonville. It's called Kennedy Boulevard. So needless to say, folk there know that this is now going to be the end really of their town because I, you put five lanes through a town like Eatonville, that's it, right? It, it's gone. Um, all of gentrification, you know, folk can no longer afford to live there. And home ownership was, Eatonville, even today, um, though it's a, you know, still a working class um, black town, um, home ownership is, is in the 90%, 90th percentile, right? So really critical. So what are they going to do? How are they going to thwart this plan from Orange County? 
So they get together with the Maitland folk because they didn't want the, this road through their town either. And the thing that they realize is that folk all over the world, from you know China to Australia to you know throughout the United States, know about this place called Eatonville, and they know about this place because of Zora Neale Hurston and her novels, and. So it becomes this sort of, you know, um, critical moment, right, where history and literature and this and her, her sort of major persona as one of the, the um, architects, if you will, and major players of the Harlem Renaissance kind of converge. Um, and so Eatonville and the Maitland folk um, hire someone to do the history and to get Eatonville placed on the historic registry for two reasons because of Zora Neale Hurston and because it was the first black town to be incorporated in the United States. That's how they save it. And, um, you know, shortly thereafter, there was a, um, a uh, they started the Preserve Eatonville community, which now has a festival every year and you can um, attend. I encourage folk if they're interested to know more, um, to, to check it out. They're usually really wonderful speakers and other kinds of things that are going on. So. That's great. We have a couple while you were while you were telling that fabulous story of Eden, but we had a couple of uh, uh, questions from the audience. Um, one was a question about um, Earl Lovelace's book um, in, being difficult to find in Miami and wondering in the public libraries and wondering whether there's whether that's a, a Trinidad Miami thing or whether it's just a we've got it we've the public library has to do better <laughs> well, <I laughs> mean, so you know i mean that's one of those things that's like the the dog chasing its tail in a way of course public libraries need to do better of course public libraries also need to be better funded of course we need to write i mean there there this is sort of a multifaceted i think um challenge it is available on amazon it's also available on in other places but of course, I you know I get the um, the the impetus for for wanting to sort of have the, the accessibility issue um, becomes a real challenge, and you know this is true of um, you know for for, for many authors, mm -hmm. um, particularly uh, you know those from the, the, the Caribbean and, and, and African diaspora. Right. Um, okay, yeah. so I just want to uh, get that one cleared, and then the next one was. Um, Asking you to, if you could talk about moccasins and lenses. How can we really walk in each other's shoes or see the world through other lenses? This is a technique that's always mentioned, but how can it really be done? Whew, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, I think, I think there are two things that, that become really important um, to do so. One is what we in in the academy would call intersubjectivity, right? It's sort of when we when we engage each other um, on the basis of and and in in sort of community, um, recognizing that um, my personhood, my identity, um, my being is intricately tied to yours and entwined with yours, and without you you know, that I would not exist. Um, and, and, you know, that is a, it's, it's a real practice, right? And in order to do that, you have to, to also very honestly position yourself um, and, um, and, and uh, you know, work to sort of both position yourself and decenter yourself at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, but the other piece of it, I think, um, is, is also sort of empathy. Right? I think, you know, we, we, we often stop at sympathy, um, but empathy is, is I think, a, a whole, of a whole other order. Um, and it demands us releasing the ego. And the ego, um, as, as we know, um, is really sort of the notion, the idea that is, is very much at the heart of um, all kinds of forms of, of, of discrimination, racism is one, certainly sexism, heterosexism, and so on. 
right? So what does it mean to sort of abandon the ego? Um, and it's, you know, it's work, um, mm -hmm. but it seems to me that it is, um, well, I mean, I think our children are telling us we have to do it. Got and, we're, and we're telling us we have to do it. Well, with that, I think with your mention of empathy, you've kind of brought us in some ways uh, full circle on this conversation. I really want to thank you um, so much, Heather. I have so many people in the chat who are like thanking you, saying you've been great. We know you're fantastic. So um, I'm going to, uh, I think the, the order of events right now is that we um, um, let everybody give you a, 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 an applause. I'll, un, I'll unmute everybody if I can remember how to do that. And then Deborah will come back on and we'll mention what we are uh, up to next week. Okay, so thank you. And let me see if I can unmute everybody. Maybe I can't find it. Um, can somebody else do it if I can? Let's see. You got it? All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Heather, you're a superstar. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay. What's that? So. Yes, I should unmute myself. I'm so technical. Um, thank you so much. That was really inspiring. And. Um, yeah, so thank you. And I just wanted to tell everyone that next week we'll be featuring Lilium Rivera. She's an award-winning writer and author of young adult literature. And her works appear in the Washington Post, New York Times, and L to name a few. She lives in LA. If you want to do a little advanced search, you can find her work and her story at liliumrivera.com. Heather, thank you once again for sharing your talents and insights with us. Um, these are challenging times, and um, you really made a difference tonight. So thank you. Yeah. Good night, really everybody. Great. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Be well.